Hello VC, it's your boy Jeff. And as promised, this is the Vinyl Tag 2021 video. Sorry, I'm just moving the camera around a little bit here. 2021 Vinyl Tag video for you. Um, yeah, I, uh, this was a good list of questions that Andrew put out uh, from Tales from the Crate. Uh, highly recommended VC channel. I've been following him for years. And <clears throat> just to give him a quick little shout out, <laughs> um, he's one of those guys that um, I've probably probably picked up more albums on his recommendations that I liked or loved than almost anybody on the VC. So um, he's one of my musical gurus, I'd call him. <laughs> There's about a handful of people that are like that for me. You know, the type of person where, you know, if they give it a thumbs up or they like it, chances are better than good that I'll probably like it too. So, um, this is I think my third or fourth Vinyl Tag video since I've been in the VC, so I had to do it. And the questions were a pretty good mix. Some were pretty easy. I had, I had the answers right off the top of my head and others I really kind of had to think about. So, I guess that's the mark of a good list. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I mean, these, these videos are popping up all over the VC, but for anyone who's new, if you're watching me on the off chance, it could happen. Um, these are 20 questions designed to make you think a little bit about your record collection and collecting habits and stuff like that. Just to make you think a little bit. So, got them all written down here and I'm gonna to try to get through them as quickly as I can. So without further ado, let's go. A discovery in 2020, question number one. <clears throat> Not a new artist by any stretch of the imagination, but Frankie Miller's The Rock, which was a gift to me from Emma over at A Final Low, was probably my favorite new to me discovery of 2020 because I played the fuck out of this album when I when I first heard it. And um, Emma's kind of one of those guru types too. You know, this is one of her favorite albums. She sent it to me, and of course, I love it too. And uh, I guess Frankie Miller was a big influence on Bob Seger. And listening to those early Seger albums, you can really hear it. So, um... Frankie Miller's got a great voice. It's kind of rough, you know, on the rougher side. Plays bluesy, soulful rock. Mm, right up my alley. So, out of everything that I've got out of 2020 that I hadn't heard before, in terms of discovering artists, this is my favorite right here. Frankie Miller. The Frankie Miller Band's The Rock. Love it. Question number two, a quarantine buy. Pink Floyd, The Dark Side Over London. Heard about this album from my friend Tim over at High Noon's Vinyl. And as soon as I saw this, I mean, it's a, it's a live performance of Dark Side of the Moon in 1994. So it would have been during their Division Bell tour. When I saw this, I had to get it. So, uh, and this, I got this in the summer, last summer, right in the thick of the quarantine, you know, when everyone was still being forced to stay home. And everyone was kind of going stir crazy. Put this record on. This will, this will turn your mind around in more ways than one. So, <laughs> um, I don't think this is actually an official release. I think this is more like a bootleg but it is out there if you are interested in a live, a mid-90s live version of Dark Side of the Moon. That's my quarantine buy. Uh, an LP you want to find in 2021, question number three. Well, just because it's super rare and super hard to find because it came out at a time before the vinyl boom, um, would be Greendale by Neil Young. Now, I got this a couple months back 
Uh, this is part of the Neil Young Archive series, and it's called Return to Greendale, and it is a live version of the album. Here, I'll show it to you. I would love to get the original studio version on vinyl. I'm hoping that someday the Neil Young Archives will reissue it. You know, it's one of those things, I don't know. It might happen, it may not. Think Albums that I thought might have never come to light have been reissued this year, and I'll be getting to that later in this list. So, uh, For my money, an LP I want to find in 2021, or I should say want to be reissued, because I'll never find it in the wild. And if I did, it would be for god-awful sums of money. But uh, Greendale by Neil Young is my answer to this question. Question number four, a box set. We're in 2021 now. This is now the 10th anniversary for me of getting back into vinyl full steam. So when it came to box sets, it was 10 years ago that I finally was able to pick up the Bruce Springsteen live 75 to 85 box set. Of course, I was a big fan of Bruce back when this was new. Couldn't really afford it back in the day when it was new. You know, this is a fairly common box set. But uh, I'll never forget, uh, back in 2011, I had just split with my ex, and I just started, um, or I should say restarted, my relationship with Core, my current wife. Um, and... I had nothing in terms of music because my ex was a pretty large record collector. 90% of those records were hers and they all went with her and the stereo too. So I had like nothing. I had like hand me down stereo to play and I went to half price books and I found this it in yeah, 2011 for like five bucks, something like that. Super cheap. So just for, uh, nostalgia and it's a great there's great music on here it's a great set I picked this up so this is my answer for a box set so a lot of the answers for these questions could be easily be answers for other questions as as you'll see as we go question number five a concept album now I know Tommy and Quadrophenia are much more famously known as concept albums by the who but for me Who's Next, which consists mostly of Lifehouse tracks, is my favorite out of the Who concept albums. I love Tommy. I love Quadrophenia. Don't get me wrong. But for my money, Lifehouse, which was the failed concept album project by the Who, um, really produced a lot of the Who's best music, at least in the studio. And many of those tracks live here. In fact, all of them do. <laughs> I think all of these were, were prepared for uh, Lifehouse. So um, you get the bare bones of a story here if you're really following the concept of it. But they're just classic Who songs. So, And this album's 50 years old this year. We're in, it's come out in 1971. So, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, there's... I think um, Pete was really reaching for things that were so far ahead of his time that nobody could really wrap their minds around it. But looking back at it now, for me, Lifehouse is the Who's best concept album, even though it never really became an official concept release. I think someday, you know, ar ar an archivist or someone related to the who or even Townsend himself should just pull all the tracks together, put them in some kind of order. I mean, I have a playlist that I made that kind of puts, you know, tracks from this album and several others in some sort of order to tell the story of Lifehouse, but I would love to get a re an official release of that someday. <laughs> okay. Question number six, an album where an artist or band changed directions. Now, his first few albums were um, high-energy, kind of jittery, new wave-ish 
albums. And then in 1981, Joe Jackson released a swing album. <laughs> this is Joe Jackson's Jump and Jive. And it is a straight jazz, Jump and Jazz Jive album. How many more J adjectives can I put in the sentence? I don't know. I can't imagine this sold well in 1981, you know, at the height of new wave, new romantic uh, type of music. But Joe's one of those guys who goes his own way no matter what. So, and this is a good album if you like, you know, that kind of music. It's very well recorded. It sounds great. And um, it's just uh, kind. Of, it was kind of anachronistic at the time, I would imagine. But looking back at it now, it's probably pretty gutsy because I, I can't imagine this helped his career at all. <laughs> but it was something that he wanted to do, and it's it's a good album. But it's definitely a 180 from you know Look Sharp or I'm the Man or anything that came before it. So Joe Jackson's Jump and Jive. That's a, a 180 if I ever saw one. Okay, question number seven, a white label promo. I don't have any white label promo albums, but, and I've showed this many moons ago, I have a white label promo, 78. Now, if you recall, my, my longtime viewers might recall that uh, Steve over at Value Vinyl gifted this to me. It's... Um, it's from World War II, and it it's just, it's classical music. You know, uh, Prelude in C-sharp minor on one side, and Tales from the Vienna Woods on the other side. But I'll quickly retell the story. The deal with this 78 is it's made of vinyl, and it's one of the first records that were ever made in vinyl because... Uh, the shellac 78s that were then the current media format uh, would always break in the overseas trip to uh, the front, in the, the, in the war front. So this music would get played to the troops and um, a lot of the records just kept breaking because you know, the shellac 78s are heavy, they're brittle, and it's just the way they are. So U.S. Army... Um, had RCA Victor do experiments on different materials to press records on. So this album, it's not this album, the 78, um, is made of one of the first records ever made out of vinyl. So for nothing else, this is an historic uh, record um, to have. And I'm honored to have it in my collection. I, I thank Steve every time I show it, so thank you. And um, it's uh, and it's white label because obviously it wasn't made for made for any kind of sale, so um, it wasn't meant to be consumed by the public or sold to the public. So it's the uh, closest thing to a white label promo album I have is this '78 right here. So that's pretty awesome. That's a I'm never gonna get rid of that one. <laughs> okay. Question number eight, a compilation album. There's so many, but if we're talking a compilation album that I don't think you would ever want to skip tracks on, it would be this soundtrack here for the movie about the Wrecking Crew. And I will just hold up the song list, and you can see that all of the artists here had major hits with um, the Wrecking Crew as the backing band. I'll just read a few off to you. Of course, Be My Baby by the Ronettes. La Bamba by Richie Valens. Um, you got The Fifth Dimension, Glenn Campbell's Wichita Lineman, uh, Mamas and the Papas, Eve of Destruction by Barry McGuire, Windy by The Association. All of the top 40 AM hits from the early to mid to only even to the late 60s were produced featuring a lot of these musicians on the Wrecking Crew. And you can find the Wrecking Crew doc, I think, on YouTube still. And <clears throat> it's highly recommended. I love that. Um, 
I love that documentary. I've watched it many times, and the music is just incredible. So for compilation albums that are all killer, literally, and no filler, you can't go wrong with this soundtrack here. Okay. Question number nine. An album that tells a story. Well, this is more a box set, but it contains multiple albums. And I'm just going to lift it up here because it's really heavy. <laughs> and I'm going to show this to you. This is the David Bowie Five Years box set that came out several years ago. Um, and at the time, I'm going to have to set this down here. At the time that this was coming out, I was just getting into David Bowie vinyl. And I wanted to get all of his albums from... <sighs> From like Space Oddity, which came out in 1969, through like Scary Monsters, which came out in 1980. And at the time, I only had a couple of of Bowie albums, but none of his early stuff. So I saw I saw this set get announced, and I was like, oh man, that would be just an instant Bowie collection right there because I didn't have any of these albums on vinyl, and it would have just been a major jump start to my collection. Only problem was, this thing was on the expensive side. So I kind of resigned myself to not getting it and just going about trying to find each album individually in the wild. Um, but before I really started doing that purposefully, Christmas that year came around, I think, I think it was 2015. I think it was Christmas 2015 when this came out. And there's this huge box under the tree. And my wife was super nervous about me opening it. And I'm like, what's, what's the big deal? So Christmas morning comes. I open the big box. This is inside. And she was like nervous because it was, it was a lot of money. And, um, but of course, how could you get mad it's at this level of generosity? So this was like one of the all-time biggest um, record gifts that my wife has ever given me. <laughs> so the story behind this album, it, al box set I should say, is that um, it was just a sign of, of my wife supporting me in this hobby. She's an incredible enabler whenever we go record shopping. Uh, if I ever question myself or think should I get this album she always says just get it just get it and of course ironically well not maybe not ironically this is like the most valuable thing I have in my collection <laughs> in terms of money at least according to what I've seen on Discogs so <laughs> um, yeah it was incredibly generous and a very nice show of love from my wife, and I'm always going to brag about her any chance I get, so thank you, honey. <laughs> That's the story behind that. All right. Um, question number 10. We're halfway through the list. I'll try to speed up. An album that needs a vinyl pressing. I'm going to qualify this question by saying this album needs a vinyl repressing because Charlatans UK between 10th and 11th was released this year on vinyl I think for the first time since it was ever released and this pressing is really not good I said this before when I first showed this album I was super excited to get this because I, I played the crap out of the CD when I when it came out and when this was announced that it was coming out on vinyl pre-ordered it right away it's you know it's a double album um, once one album is the original between 10th and 11th and the other album is a live performance at uh, Metro in Chicago from 1991 so but the volume on this is very low it's very muffled sounding very muted sounding there's no like the mids and highs are just not there. So wherever they, whatever the source material was for this, may have been a crappy digital copy, I don't know. 
or I don't know if it was the pressing. This was pressed on clear vinyl, but the sound on this is just not good. So if you, any of you out there are thinking of buying this album, don't. So I'm, I'm qualifying this question by saying this needs to be repressed. <laughs> repressed right. I would be the first in line to buy it. But as it is, this one is no, no, no bueno, no bueno. Okay. Question number 11. A common album and an uncommon album. I see the Cars first album everywhere I go. Any half price books, any record show, any estate sale, which is where I bought this one. Chances are pretty good you're going to see the Cars first album in the stack somewhere. Because it's a classic album. It's great. Don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of the Cars. Love this record. But I see it everywhere. And... I'm sure I will continue to see it everywhere whenever I'm able to go record digging or shopping or estate selling again. <laughs> An uncommon album. I took this not so much in terms of rarity, but in terms of the effect it had on music, and that is the complete plantation recordings of Muddy Waters. This came out, uh, I think this came out in 2018. It's the Analog Productions issue, QRP pressed, and this is made to look like the original folio that the 78s came in, although these are LPs. I'll show you a little bit of the gatefold. Now why? Would this be considered an uncommon album in my mind? Um, probably because uh, I think to me the Alan Lomax Delta recordings of American blues artists in the early 40s is probably the most significant um, leap forward in American music. I think the only thing that would probably can. Uh, Compared to this would be like maybe the Robert Johnson recordings in terms of the effect it had on music. I mean, this is literally where a lot of the music that we listen to began as it mutated off into, you know, electric blues and rock and pop and other things. So um, in terms of being uncommon, I can't really think of many other albums that would have the same effect on music as these Alan Lomax recordings were. Um, yeah, so I don't know if I answered that question correctly or not, but to me, I mean, and this sounds fantastic. If you are a blues lover or a musical historian or interested in, in you know, the very, very early um, acoustic blues sounds, get this if you can get it because it is well worth your your time and attention so that's my uncommon album all right question number 12 an ep this was an easy one planet england by robin hitchcock and andrew partridge this came out in i want to say 2018 2019 sorry here's the back just four songs uh robin sings lead and i it, all this really does is make you wish for a full length album from these two because it's that good you know i'm a big fan of robin hitchcock i'm a big fan of xtc of which andy partridge is the singer main singer and songwriter of and uh this just it, it's just going to whet your appetite for more <laughs> four songs are just like it's like a teaser so yeah <laughs> not very much into eps you know i don't really collect them or, or go after them very much but this was the only format that was available in on vinyl so i just went for it it's my ep a girl group i'm going for a classic diana ross and the supremes don't have a ton of girl group records in my collection so, but really, how can you go wrong with Diana Ross and the Supremes? I mean, this has got to be 
you know, one of the biggest, most famous of them all. So, enough said there. An album cover you love. Just because it's so quirky, and the album itself is so quirky too. Chris Bell's I Am The Cosmos. I just love the juxtaposition of him looking like he's floating up there among the mountains. <laughs> it it just between that and the title it just it just all seems to kind of go it doesn't make sense really but the more you think about it it kind of does this is just the back cover here but for a quirky album cover and a quirky album if you are a fan of big star you already know chris bell was a founding member and he appeared on their first album uh, and then after which he left and he put this out a couple of years later after Big Star imploded. And um, if you're a fan of Big Star, you'll love this album too. So it's been reissued a couple of years ago. Should be easy to find. Highly recommended for that kind of Big Star power pop-ish type of music. Chris Bell's I'm the Cosmos. That was a tough question to, to think about. Favorite album cover. <laughs> that, that was one of the harder ones, I gotta say. 15, an album you've listened to the most. This is gonna be an oddball one because I could have easily said, you know, a Beatles or a Stones or a Zeppelin or any number of classic rock um, albums that I grew up with and still listen to sort of, you know, to this day. But in terms of listening to music in the car, which is a significant part of my listening time these days. August by Eric Clapton has gotten the most plays on my iPod over the past year than anything else. I'll just admit it. I know you're thinking, what, Eric Clapton? August? Really? Yeah. This is a great album. This is my OG copy from 1986 when this came out. And, um... Produced by Phil Collins. Uh, play, I think he plays on a lot of the tracks. It just, I just love the mix of his high energy drumming. And Eric feels like he's got more energy in him in this playing. Yeah, it's, it's a big 80s production style type of album. I get that. But I'm a child of the 80s, so I love shit like this. So... <laughs> In terms of, of this year, one of the albums that I played the most, qualifying the answer by in, in my car, listening on my iPod, this would be the answer. August by Eric Clapton. Okay. Question number 16. An album you had to get an OG copy of. This was gifted to me, but there would have been no other way to get this album than an OG copy because they're just not going to re-release it ever. And that would be Noah by the Bob Seger System. This was gifted to me by Legendary Jim last year. And um, this completed my early Bob Seger collection. I found all the other ones. I, uh, I was actually gifted Brand New Morning by Noble Records a couple years ago. I spent buku bucks on a OG copy of Back in 72. But this one just eluded me for years. Never saw it in the wild, and trying to find it online was just way too expensive. And then, just like the great guy he is, Legendary Jim sent me a package. And the last one in there <laughs> was this one. This was the big one. So, OG copies of this are going to be the only way to go for this album because um, Seeger hates these early albums. He doesn't even sing on every single track. Oh, I got the, uh, the letters. There we go. The letter is still... I keep the letters with uh, these records when I get them. Like that is VCLT. So, um, yeah. For his uh, pre-Night Moves, pre-Live uh, Bullet era, you can find about half of his albums easily. They've been reissued, but the ones that were not capital records issues um I don't, or was this a capital one oh this was but this one 
Brand New Morning and Back in 72 are the bitches to find. And any Seeger collector will tell you that. So, um, yeah, had no choice. But that's, uh, that's my answer for the... Had to get an OG copy of it. Question. Number 17, the last album you purchased right after Christmas. I had a balance on an Amazon gift card, so I used that to get this reissue by Bobby Gentry. It's her second album called The Delta Suite. Uh, saw this on Mazzy's, one of Mazzy's videos earlier this year. Um, this is reissued in... It's a double album, but the first album is a stereo mix. The other is mono. And um, saw him uh, show this album, and I think he played a, a little clip of it at the end of one of his videos. So I went to Spotify, and I streamed it for a while, and I really liked it, so I wanted to have a physical copy. So this was the, the last album that I purchased. Right at the end of 2020. So um, this will be showing up in a spin zone soon. There you go. Uh, number 18, an album that they don't get. Well, I'm just going to say it. In terms of music that I like, that probably nobody else really wants to even admit that they like, is Tom Jones. I could go on and on about Tom Jones, but suffice it to say... His voice is so powerful, it's so big, that it raises the material to a different level, even if that material is not really up to a Tom Jones standards. <laughs> I think uh, Tom Jones could have really sung anything. He could have sung any kind of music and he could have made it sound good. But... You know, he's kind of stuck with that what's new pussycat, you know, thing. And and I don't mind that song either, but um, a lot of his hits sound like they were played by a polka band. <laughs> to be honest, I still like it, but it's more because of his voice than anything else. So, um I can't really think of anybody who honestly openly admits that they like Tom Jones. So, there you go. Uh, a punk album. Not a big punk guy, but for my money, the first album by The Clash is classic punk. I love The Clash. I love them more than The Sex Pistols. But to me, The Clash were more than just a punk band. Or they became more than just a punk band in, in later albums. But for this one here, yeah, you, you can't get much better. It's raw. It's just in your face. And it's amazing. So, self-titled first album by The Clash is my answer for that. And last but not least, question number 20. Your favorite reissue of 2020? PJ Harvey. They've started reissuing her entire catalog... And this one came out a couple of months ago, I think back in September, October. This is one of my favorite albums by her. It's called To Bring It By Love. And I was more than thrilled to get this album. And I've picked up, I have a few of her albums on vinyl, but they're UK bootlegs. I may go back and get the official releases of maybe one or two more of her records, but um, this is an official reissue right here. Sounds great, and it's just a great album front to back. She's one of my favorite artists of the 90s. So, PJ Harvey's To Bring You My Love. Favorite reissue of 2020. Love this record. And there you go. I'm closing in on 34 and a half minutes. Sorry it took so long. But for 20 questions, it's a lot. <laughs> without just flashing albums quickly. I, don't, I can't think of any quick way to do these type of things, but if you made it to the end, thank you, and I love you all, and I'm feeling more energized to make videos, and I've got a few ideas 
percolating for things to come. So um, beyond just spin zones. So fingers crossed. I'll see you guys sooner than later. Everybody take care. Stay warm. Be safe. I love you all. It's Jeff.